I'm Jason DiMartino, and uh, you know, I, I served. Um, I'm serving in the United States Marine Corps, um, and uh, I'm, I'm a reservist. And the uh, you know, I, I used to really believe in a state. I used to really believe in in forced organization, and central planning. Um, and uh, you know, slowly I started to realize that you know how the government was funded specifically um, was the issue uh, with the morality because I started to ponder my own morality as a man and I felt that that was uh, you know that was a problem that I had not thought of this enough especially as someone who had uh, you know previously went to Catholic school and then I'd been taught about morals and, and so on and so forth um, so I debated with friends and uh, my friend Dwayne very close personal friend of mine uh, was a libertarian and he started to tell me about theory um, and then after that, you know, Hayek, Rand, uh, Rothbard, they did the rest of me. So what were the main issues that made you lean towards wanting to have those kinds of discussions? Well, I felt as though people didn't think about the, uh, the morality of their situation often. Enough. People, uh, you know, they supported things like um, uh, diff different central planning programs that were at cost of other people. And they never really thought to ask themselves how those were actually funded or if they were funded in a manner which was good or bad. Um, they kind of just said they wanted funded, uh, and you know, that, that's barring even uh, what is a war. Um, you know, and, and that's not even, like we can totally get into uh, whether the United States military has been legitimate or not in its past 100 years of war, but um, I just don't think it has been. Uh, you know, we've been going around bombing places that aren't our own um, and just destroying them without actually like you know, if we like I, I like the Ron Paul idea of this. If we conduct free trade, if we conduct uh, if we conduct free trade, then at the end of the day, we'll have diplomacy because that's just the most optimal aspect to look at what we both have and to want to gain. Have you seen any of uh, like actual practical results of this type of bad thinking in terms of funding policy and in terms of like actual results? Was there a particular person that you knew or you just looked at society and saw that it was a problem? Mm, the problem that I saw with society, because it's mainly a problem, it wasn't just, a, I guess, one instance where I thought, oh, wow, this is just, you know, terrible. Um, when I when I started to do research into libertarianism and I found that, you know, uh, there are huge misallocations of resources due to credit expansion and stuff like that. I heard, you know, so many jobs were lost in like 08 and 06. And um, of course, with credit expansion being done in the Great um, great Recession um, and Depression. Um, when I first learned about that, I was like, wow, this is evil. Someone should say that the government did this. And, you know, I, I found out that, ever, that a lot of people were saying from Mises Institute that the government did this. And people just kind of brushed it off and shrugged it off. Um, and uh, the fact that the government, you know, manipulates booms and bust cycles, um, and maybe it doesn't intentionally do it, but in its, you know, attempt to create prosperity, it kills it. Um, people should know that's an ineffectual way of going about creating jobs, uh, creating production and creating what people demand. Um, if we just allow people to conduct reserve banking, if we just allow people to conduct their own investment in production, uh, then we will see a, a steady and also, also, of course, there's reserve credit. So it's not like, you know, manipulated credit. We will see a steady growth in the economy. We will see what people demand. We will see what people save, um, and they will be at their own way. They, they will be at their own whim, essentially, to the consequences of their actions, uh, which I think is a very good thing. And um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, it will be a better situation than these short booms of, of beautiful technology and uh, and jobs, and then a huge bust that takes like five years to recover, and then we have a little boom again. You know, it just doesn't make much sense to me. Or even longer, you know, sometimes with quantitative easing, it's been like, what has it been, 10 years or something since the, la since the last market correction? Well, it's, it's, it's it, I think, and, and we've also, you know, reset interest rates to like 0.25%. And now we're starting to climb back up because now we have to, you know, account for how much capital is actually there. So we're on our way to another one. I mean, it, it's, it's, hopefully it's, it's longer, it's in like two years as opposed to one, but you know, it could be any day now, and we're just waiting for the clock to tick. Yeah, I think the interest rate's up at like 4% or something right now, and historically speaking, it had been up around 20%. The interest national interest rate is like the most important price there is, because it's the price of money, basically. It has to equilibrate at some place, because if you have a manipulated interest rate, then people are going to keep investing without a signal to stop investing, 
Um, and that really, I mean, the, the, people don't get that that's a natural driver of an economy. And the, the reason why, like, you can ask a politician, um, you know, why doesn't anybody invest in Venezuela right now? And it's because the capital, because there, there's there's too much capital floating around. The capital is totally devalued. You can't uh, you can't keep expecting the American dollar to be strong when there's three billion, three trillion dollars, thirty trillion dollars in the American people's hands. It's just going to look worthless. It's going to look like toilet paper. Um, and they really don't understand that. And I think Venezuela is a great example of what happens when you conduct hyperinflation, just like Zimbabwe was a great example. But no one wants to hear it. They're like, no, no, no. The American dollar is too strong. Too many people have faith in it. I'm not going to have faith in it when, you know, everybody has to tack on another zero to their, like, check. <laughs> it's going to look stupid. Right. I think. Yeah, you mentioned something earlier about, um, you know, the government getting into all these things and not knowing when to stop investing or whatever. I think it was Milton Freeman that said that there's there's not necessarily an issue with the things that the government tries is that they've totally eliminated a feedback mechanism to see that either this is, is working or it's not working because they get paid in tax money either way. Yep. That's the, that's something I talk about quite a bit. Um, I, in, in both of my books an act as ominous, I talk about it a little bit. Um, and in, uh, in, in one of my first like books, kind of Veritas Libertas, um, I talk about something that I kind of didn't really know about and I called it mechanisms for redress. Um, and essentially it means that like, you know, when a private company gum- comes into a situation and has to conduct a work, they have to respond to the satisfaction of their customer. They have to respond to the costs. Um, they have to respond to a number of other things like their competitor. Um, a government has no such competitor. It does not have to worry about costs. It does not have to worry about the satisfaction of the job it, it you know, uh, it supplies. Um, and Milton Friedman's awesome, but I, I'm not too much of a Milton Friedman fan just because I, I don't like Chicago school. You know, I'm, I'm more of an Austrian guy. I'm, I'm the same way. He had great – initially, he had, I think he had great videos and lectures. But, like, later on, yeah, roads are good and all that. I'm like, come on, Milton. I mean, that's not freedom. He's good on basic economic theory, and he talks about it in an entertaining way on live TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, he shut up a lot of liberals back then. Um, but, he, like, the reason I like Hayek more, too, is because, um, you know, I, I, mean, I again, I don't agree with Hayek totally either. I'm an anarchist. But um, – uh, Hayek, you know, he said that the market was our liberty and stuff like that. And uh, one thing I like that Hayek, Hayek's greatest contribution, you probably know this too, is that the knowledge problem or, or the specialization of not and, and division of knowledge in, in society. And the government just inherently, we can go into the specifics. And Milton Friedman did that for us. He did great. He, he went into a lot of specifics, and they're like, they're like, no, 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 it doesn't matter because in my society, the government will set the price. And I'm like, that's exactly the problem. They don't know the price. So, and and it's kind of a, a feedback. But I think Hayek was um, my favorite Austrian just because of his um his understanding of like people as individuals and 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 their knowledge so specific to them that it's just indiscernible by an outside actor who is just uninvolved. And the government in reality is uninvolved. You know, it can be there, it can say it's involved, but it doesn't know how much this coffee cup means to me. Only I do. You know. Right. Yeah. The idea that value is subjective, I think, bothers a lot of people. And there was a guy named Rory Sutherland who did a TED talk about Mises' theory on subjective nature of value. And he said, look around at the marketplace and see how many look out there and, and name how many stupid things that there are for sale. Well, it's stupid to me, but they're, I'm not their customer, so it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Um, it's like one example was uh, if... Well, sometimes sometimes the measure of value is something that nobody could ever guess until you really start to dig into the psyche of your customers. So say, for example, there's a restaurant and they have the best quality food in the world. Mm. If they want to raise their prices, they don't need to focus on that. The you, you, So let's say somebody goes to the restaurant and the floor smells like sewage and there's poop on the floor. I've heard this Merle Murphy. Yeah, yeah. If if there's if they want to raise their prices and increase the value to their customers, they need to clean up the floor. They don't need to raise the quality of the food even further because it's already as high as it can be. Like, it, they have the best, the freshest food in the world, and they're reviewed as the highest by everybody. So, yeah, they need to clean up the floor. Now, if you want to say that's a side issue, that's okay, that's fine. Because ultimately, if you're a restaurant, the only thing that matters is the food. Because if you don't have food you're by definition not a restaurant anymore. Yeah. But so yeah, it's the secondary thing that 
until you actually started to think about your customers. Hmm, why, what do customers want to see? If they were to come into this restaurant, what makes them feel the most comfortable? And yeah, it's a nice environment. It's what music is playing. Are the bathrooms clean? Are the people friendly? What are the, what are the wait staff wearing? You know, all that stuff, which is all ultimately speaking secondary things. It's the manner in which something is presented. It has nothing to do with the actual item of the food, which is, you could argue is all that you're technically buying that's like a real physical item the rest of the stuff is yeah, kind of the physical, yeah. yeah metaphysical yeah the um one of the things like i, I like i like how you bought it up because i i think that it's a it's a great libertarian argument I, i've heard block like block and, and murphy used it sometimes too and it's that that you know value is inquantifiable to humans and in a lot of ways happiness is inquantifiable you know like like um some people on my on my live streams they said Oh, that's so shallow. It's so dark. Why would you say a hug is a transaction? And I say, well, it is. It's not me. Like, like, like. It's an emotional transaction. Is... Yeah. 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 It's it's an exchange of value in some way where you. It's either you don't want to hug the guy too much, but you'd feel bad if you didn't hug him, right? So you give him a hug, and it's an exchange in which you you necessarily gain because you don't upset him, right? Or it's one where you do want to hug the guy because you love him and you want to embrace him. And feeling the hug is just, you know, it's, it's the, the Keynesians having a hard time plugging it into, plug it into his computer. And that's the thing with the restaurants too. People go to restaurants to feel good. They, they go to, they go to delis uh, for the most part because they, they feel nice. They feel well treated and respected. Um, I have a deli that I go to beautiful sandwiches. Why I like it though. Cause I know the staff and they're friendly. No one can calculate that. No one can plug that into a computer and, and it'll get, up. Oh, Jason will do this average a time a year. Like it, 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 it's not possible or he'll spend this much money here. It's because I go there for reasons other than to obtain scarce resources, which is why Chicago school, Keynesians and modern monetary theories, I think they're all wrong. You know, it's not that I don't think they're trying. I, I mean, when I first heard that, you know, economics was a logic and not a uh, numerical science, I was like, well, that's not true. I mean, it's go, we've got to be able to account for people. Right. It, it, it is kind of marvelous to see um, kind of how the market evolves and how we can't really calculate for it and we can't really predict human action and uh, what makes people happy. And that's kind of the beautiful thing about it. We don't need to. We don't need to, as libertarians or as people who believe in the libertarian philosophy um, in, in this aspect – just let it grow. Let it happen in that area where people demand that product and they, they're satisfied and no one's getting harmed, you know, and then that's chill with it. Right. Um, yeah, we don't even necessarily have to understand the theory of value because ultimately speaking in the marketplace, the only thing that matters is what does the other person value that they don't currently have and can I give it to them? That's the only thing. So if it doesn't have to make sense to you, you just have to be aware enough to be able to figure out what that is and ask to ask the person what do you what do you value what's important to you and we're, we're also both uh, we're always both producers and consumers um um i had a i had a friend on named caleb uh, he wrote an awesome essay that's going to be in our next book it's called capitalism towards prosperity um and he, he wrote awesome an awesome essay on the central on central banking um and he said to me once you know like you know jay we're talking um and right now uh I'm giving you my voice and you're giving me your ears and we're conducting an exchange uh, because we see it's valuable. Once we determine that both of us you know, don't see this as valuable, we say, what are we doing here? And mm-hmm. we end it. Human beings aren't, aren't, uh, aren't you know, super stupid. Uh, there are a lot of people who are on the leftist spectrum, um, they like to think that humans on their own are just these idiots who can't do anything and they can't plan anything. And that's why we need you know, someone else to tell us what to do. And um, that's, a, that's another thing. I mean, would you like to go? Would you? I, would, I want to ask you on it. What's your uh, take on modern left in this country? Because honestly, um, I, I mean, I know you're, you're more theocratic, and and you know maybe you're not as 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 uh, libertarian in certain aspects as me. But how do we deal with you know the modern left as far as um, I guess conversation goes? Because it's a bit impossible to have any with me. <laughs> Basically. Uh... There, there's a difference like what what I think they are versus how to win them over are two very different discussions what I think they are is basically just selfish people mm-hmm. they think of well the world needs to give me everything that I want and I get and I get to take it mm-hmm. and that goes even down to identity and like what you call me and how you think about me I want to be able to have control mm-hmm. over and you owe me your thoughts basically 
your your thinking about me needs to be done in a certain manner and also so yeah basically it's the religion of uh i of i am god and i get to tell everybody what they are supposed to owe to me in my um in my like kind of like discernment of it now I, I agree with you in part there um the the main thing that i i think about the left now is that if it's just about th- their self right I, I don't think it's just about their self they have this problem of going around it and, and diagnosing an area and then saying all right, you have to sacrifice for oh, X has a sacrifice for Y, and Y has to Y just can just sit and do nothing. Um, and they don't understand it economically, of course, but on a moralistic level, um, I think that they're very flawed. They, they, they're asking for other people to sacrifice for what they desire. Um, and I understand that you know maybe they maybe they do have some goodness in their heart where they want to do charity and they want to see someone prosper. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, the the use of force for prosperity. Um, it is, you know, in a way slavery. And would you agree with me that like using coercion, um, to act on the innocent, right. To ascertain the is desirable is like wrong. Yeah. You can never force somebody else to sacrifice. You can only, the only type of sacrifice that you have available and that you have authority over, uh, would be your own, your own time and efforts. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we do that all the time. That's the basis of work is me giving, I sacrifice something and I get a return off of it. Of course, of course, and um, I think that that's uh, that's something we gotta help hit with people because, like, I have um, a lot of Democrat and liberal. Where are you, by the way? I'm in New York. I'm in uh, North Texas, about an hour and fifteen minutes north of Dallas. North Texas is that is that is that a, a blue area or no? Um, Texas is pretty much all red except all the major metroplexes. So, like Dallas is D- Dallas is the county is blue. Austin, Houston, San Antonio um, are all. Like where, wherever people are highly concentrated, it's blue. But outside of yeah. the big cities, it's all red. As unfortunate. I have a lot of dem- I have a lot of friends who are, are leftists or who lean left um, on a lot of issues, and I try to talk to them about it. Some of them I'm, I'm I'm very persuasive, but what I found to be the most effective is saying to them, "Listen, so if there's if there's a bread maker." Um, and he doesn't want to break any, make any more bread because he can't gain anymore. No one wants to trade with him. Um, but the bread is still a valuable commodity for some reason, and, and no one wants to trade with him. I don't know why. All right. Are you going to uh, force the bread maker to produce bread? Um, and they, and some of them will say if, uh, for, to produce bread for the hungry, right? Something like that. Um, and some of them will say off the bat, yes, I would. And um, a friend, Eddie, who said this to me. And... I was like, you know, Eddie, that, that's that's tantamount to slavery. And he was like, no, it's not slavery. People need to eat. And I was like, well, Eddie, how would you say? How would you feel if I said people need to wear cotton? And uh, <laughs> and I said that's why we need to make the slaves happen. Yeah, um, that's good. And he said it was a false dichotomy and stuff like that. I'm like, no, it's not. It's the same uh, normative function, same logical function. Um, and you're you're making another human being conduct your will, an innocent one. Uh, just because the outcome is desirable. It's like if I said I should be able to rape somebody because the outcome is desirable at the end. So, you know, it was a trade-off. It was involuntary. That's what made it immoral. Um, so you want to talk about apodictic ethics, right? The, the, in the book? Yeah. So let's talk about your book. Um, so you said it's called Actus Hominis, Human Ethics Defined. When did you release it? I released it about two months ago. Or not, not two months ago. About a month and a half ago right now. Uh late January. Uh, so that was, uh, that was when I, uh, I first, uh, released it. Um, I did action of man, um, which I didn't want to copy off of Thomas Aquinas. I didn't want to copy off of Mises. It just so happened that I use actus hominis. Um, but yeah, I rolled with it. Um, and main, the main topic of this book, um, is the essay called apodictic ethics, um, and apodictic ethics. And it, it should be in the updated versions. If not, then, you know, just, uh, email me on my, on, on my Instagram page. But, um, the main point of apodictic ethics is that they are certain, um, hence their name apodictic, uh, and I got them using uh, using deductive reasoning. Um, and the reason I do this, and I know that you know you're theocratic, and, and maybe some of your viewers are theocratic, so um, I'll, I'll explain this. The reason why I'm not using, uh, I don't, you know, go to a um, more of like a, a mystics approach or like studying the, the gospel or something or theology, um, is because I wanted to use the deductive and inductive proofs because and in a sympathetic case i i can try to understand what what some theologians say but I, you know i can only um 
conclusively prove the deductive and inductive. So it's it's not like an offense to anybody. It's just that that's the that's the world I'm working with with it. Um, and the deductive there there are four uh, deductive proofs. Um, one of them being uh, self ownership. Um, and you know the self ownership is based on being uh, you being the genesis of your initiative. Uh, I own the initiative. Like you know, uh, Jason picks up mug. Um, therefore, I'm you know ipso facto I must own the genesis. Um, just a deductive uh, uh, a deductive parallel there. Um, and that that reveals you know self ownership because if I must claim ownership over the initiative, you know we don't say uh, Dylan went and uh, you know uh, threw an alligator into the lake. Or no, sorry, sorry, we don't say the city went and threw an alligator into the lake. We say Dylan went and threw an alligator into a lake because we're not collective beings; we're individual beings, um, and we own our initiatives. And you know we and I, I hate to reiterate this, but because we own that initiative, we must own the start of that initiative, which is you. Now, a lot of people contest this and say to me, oh, well, Jason, if I say to you the word plump and you think plump in your head, um, aren't I the genesis of the initiative? I'm like, no. On an inductive level, my brain was the one who ultimately had to conduct the initiative of thought um, or to, to, you know, to conduct chemical interactions, which uh, made the initiative of thought. Um, and it's like if you said – if I was a corpse and you said to me, Jason, plump, I, nothing would happen because there's nothing going on up here. Right. Uh, yeah, so that's my first proof. Uh, now, do you have? I, I'm totally willing to like talk about it because I know you have a different stance on this. Sure. Yeah, we come. Uh, this is a, a question that I'll get to later. We can talk about it later, but I'll just touch on it real quick. Um, the so I, we come to a lot of the same conclusions in terms of like we're responsible for ourselves. I would disagree on a technicality, but we do end up at a lot of the same uh, reasoning. Like our, a lot of our conclusions are going to be the same. Um, mm-hmm. I don't agree with um, self-ownership on a technicality. I believe in self-stewardship. So I'm responsible for myself, but ultimately I don't, I don't own myself. So that's where I get the ideas of um, like why we can't steal and murder and coerce other people. And that type of thing is because God has said that we can't do it and he'll, we'll be prosperous if we obey. Okay. But we can get into that later. So I want to uh, hop back to your book real quick. Um, What's your book about and um, why did you write it in the first place? Um, well, the book is about uh, essentially, uh, um, you know, certain ethics uh, as to to end the uh, kind of end the case of ethics. A lot of you know, a lot of people try to rationally discern ethics, uh, like Stephen Molyneux, uh, Kant, um, uh, you know, Hop, and all of that. And I appreciate their works, and I, I, I really appreciate argumentation ethics. I kind of use self detonation, self detonating arguments here, um, but I kind of wanted to have a final word in on it, not because I'm egotistical, but because I feel like they're close in their discernments, like universally preferable behavior had some good ideas. Um, don't necessarily think it's true. Um, argumentation ethics I had a lot of, I love performative contradictions, but I don't think ethics is based in, in, in argument. I think it's based in action. Um, and, uh, you know, among other, uh, among other things about Kant's categorical imperative, I, I didn't feel that lying was a bad thing necessarily. Um, so I, I just said, Hey, listen, they're great. They have some allegories. I don't like, so I wanted to correct on them. Um, and that was one of the reasons I, I went for that. And me and my friend Dwayne Grant, who's, uh, who's writing metaphysics right now, he, he has, we're, we're, conduct, we're, uh, we're writing a whole new philosophy. It's called moral logicism. Um, and it's also, it, we're, we're also writing an economic philosophy called New York School of Thought, uh, which is essentially Austrian with a few tweaks, um, which it, it, it's too much to get into, to be honest. Have you had any responses to your book that you thought were particularly interesting? People that have read a lot it. of people like it. A lot of people do like it. Um, I've had no one who really said, "Oh, I hate it." Um, there's some essays in here that aren't the strongest, like the logical and moral denotations of anarchism, uh, as one of the essays. It's, it's essentially a collection of essays. Um, it's not really one framed book. You know, I'm not that good. I'm only like 21, um, so it's more just like a collection of dissertations and all that. Um, so my weakest essay in here has to be logical and moral denotations of anarchism. But beyond that, you know, I think it's a strong book. I've got some great reactions from it. What do people tend to focus on the most? They tend to focus on the apodictic ethics making sense. They like the idea that, listen, hey, we can go through it. Um, and there are five total proofs to it. And someone said to me, oh, yeah, I really found the axiom of self-interestedness. I found it. Um, to be very relevant in my life. And uh, it wasn't supposed to be an anecdotal thing, of course, but um, it, it's, they, they can see it in front of them, you know, like being um, kind of like it, it's, a, it's the bravest mix of argumentation ethics, in my opinion, with, you know, um, 
human action and stuff. And I think people can really advocate, uh, really, really appreciate that. Sorry. Um, and I think that's what people really took from it. A lot of people love the the first two axioms, which is self interestedness and self ownership. Um, and then people like they like the form of contradiction stuff. Um, also, I, I totally blow away moral relativists because like, um, and people who I know in my own circle were like, "Wow, that's crazy!" Um, because you can't use logic to argue against logic, um, and that are against all logic. A lot of moral relativists say, "Hey, you can't use logic because." Uh, um, logic has nothing to do. It's not, it's not, it's not a part of, um, you know, how humans should behave. And, uh, then you say to them, well, you're also using a logic to interpret how humans should behave in that. Exactly. Therefore, you know, you self detonate. Um, can't get so away there's from a lot it. of self. You can't, you really can't. Um, self in the axiom of self interest also has a self detonating clause. Uh, same with the self ownership stuff being the genesis of your initiative and, and you know, having self interest in conducting the, the argument and stuff like that. So I'll, I'll go all day. I, all five of them have self-detonating clauses, um, and that automatically falsifies their argument. But it, it is fun to hear some of the arguments against it. I, one person told me that um, being the genesis of the initiative doesn't mean anything. It just means we're autonomous. Um, and I said to him, well, does um, – I think his name was John. And uh, I said, is John talking to me right now, or is it like the community you know, talking to me right now? And he said, well, I'm just like a biological robot. And I was like, you got to be kidding me, right? <laughs> like, this can't be, you have to be somebody. So in, in other words, you have no meaning whatsoever, which, which, why are you even talking? Determinists, right? Like, you, you know, those determinist guys yeah. who are like, uh, oh yeah, no, I'm just a, I'm just a bone and muscle and uh, ones and zeros up here. I'm a chemical reaction. I'm a, I'm a can of soda that's just fizzing so you can't tell me yeah. that i'm doing anything right or wrong i just do what i do yeah i love those guys and the thing is like i'm kind of empathetic to the determinist view too because i'm not very religious but I, I i'm empathetic to it and i say to them listen listen guys there should be there should be a discernible good if there's not a discernible good then you know there's no point in having these discussions and stuff like that on one hand and on the other hand there should there there's obviously a way humans should act uh, that's dictated by nature in some way. I mean, it, it just ha it, there has to be. Um, it's it's because we can see that we can interact with each other, and there are results to those interactions. Um, and that's just like one idea of why. Hey, um, ethics is a thing. Uh, how humans should treat one another is a big thing in society. Um, and I'm like, listen, my thing just says, you know, don't hurt anybody, don't steal. I, I don't get how those 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 things are that big to you. I don't think why. Why these these edicts shouldn't be reactively enforced? They don't require big co coercion. They don't require uh, someone going around reminding everybody of the ethics. Uh, just kind of like basic human stuff. So I got a question for you. Yeah. Um, if somebody were to say, okay, if I, so I mean, you and I would agree that if you do uh, bad things, you initiate force on other people, then you're ultimately going to get it back in some form or another like yeah. you're in the long term you're either going to have a shorter life a less productive life um probably have fewer children or maybe even your children won't do so well because of resources that you didn't have if somebody was totally okay with all of those consequences would you still have a problem with somebody saying like i really don't care if i live a long time i don't care if my children are going to be worse off and the people around me are going to be worse off i'm willing to accept all of the results for those actions would you still have a problem with somebody violating the the nap well yes i would i mean the the, the nap is the is the maximum in which you know we, we kind of respect each other um if someone says i don't care on to uh, what happens to my children if I violate the nap. Um, honestly, I mean, it, if they're willing to accept all the consequences, right? Because, like, do you believe oh, yeah, in yeah, yeah, yeah. do you believe in ultimate justice, or do some people get away with stuff? And does that bother you? Well, I mean, I think that in any society, some people will get away with. I, I, mean, I might I might be not understanding the question here a bit. Uh, I think that in this society, uh, like ours now, in an ANCAP society, in uh, in any society. There will be people that will, you know, slip through the cracks of any system, even in decentralized justice. I think decentralized justice would be very, you know, uh, I think it would be very efficient because it would be competitive and have market mechanics. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, there would be people that would just slip through the cracks. Now, if someone was OK with the ramifications of violating the NAP, um, could you just explain that to me? Like, what do you mean by OK with it? Like if they go commit murder and they're cool with like getting murdered because of that? Um, 
or not getting murdered, getting killed, right? right. Um, because of that. Um, right. So like Hitler is on his deathbed and he says to the person next to him, you know, I killed way more people than, than I'm worth. Like I'm, I'm only one person. So I killed six million, six million people or I had a hand in killing six million people and I die. I'm in the green or in the red, however you want to think about it. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, does that bother you that that Hitler didn't have to die six million times? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 in a, yeah, I don't think it was it was proper justice. Um, the, I want to write a book one day, and it's not going to be anytime soon. It's going to be called Man's Search for Justice and stuff. Because I am under, I, I understand the plight of like you know, like listen, if someone goes and kills your family, and like I understand, I, I can say like, hey, listen, no idea what your anger is like, but I know it's probably furious. Um, and the person who killed your family in cold blood. He should die a pretty painful death. Um, and I think that there's, there's a clause that me and my friend and I, I wrote it here a bunch of times in the back because the back needs to be a little bit thicker so Amazon actually publishes it. Um, and it's the non-aggression principle repeated a bunch of times. I, I have it off bat, but I'll just read it from here. The non-aggression principle dictates that the, in, the initiation of force is unethical and totally immoral. And the only ethical forces are reactive necessary ones, right? Um, reactive and necessary primarily meaning um listen i need it needs to have happened to me and it needs to be necessary for me to react to you i think if someone rapes somebody um in in my ideal and cap society that the rapist will likely be put to death because you know there's no penance you can conduct for rape it, it, i don't see how one can conduct penance for rape of another person i don't see how someone can conduct penance for murder uh you really end someone there now beating I kind of get how that's a pretty horrible event, but it's not something where they were violated in such a way that they'll probably have nightmares for the rest of their lives. Um, so I think that someone could make penance for a beating, you know, going out and assaulting someone or stealing someone's property. They can, you know, work for them or work for their insurance company and help repay them and stuff like that. And, you know, repay them and then some. So, um, and then of course they're not going to be living a happy life. So they're going to be, you know, they're going to know the consequences of their actions at that point. Um, but yeah, rapists and murderers have no sympathy in my heart. And if they do what they do and they're not criminally insane, then I think that, uh, you know, the ultimate punishment should be death. Now, I know you're saying God, you're saying hell, right? Like Hitler should be dying six million more times. Do you think Hitler is dying six million more times? Uh, well, technically, no, I would say. But he's dying. He's dead forever in that sense. He's in he's he's burning in hell if he wasn't a believer, but uh, which I'm pretty sure that he was not. Um, mm. at least based on the way that he acted. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of the stuff that you just mentioned, I would really agree with in terms of theft, like you repay somebody plus extra for, you know, interest, loss of time, um, loss of opportunity that that person, uh, had. Um, mm. so, and that's, that's actually biblical. So I find it very interesting that we have a, a, some agreement there. So the biblically speaking, mm. there is no, there's no outline for a prison system at all. If you steal something, so let's say I steal a thousand dollars from you. If I'm caught, then I have to pay the thousand dollars back, and then whatever I had sought to do to you is done to me. So then I add another thousand. Mm. So I would pay you back double. So um, if I stole the thousand dollars, and then let's say I went and I invested it somewhere, so now it's in a business and I don't have it anymore and I can't give it back to you, then I should be able, I should have to repay you quadruple. Okay. Because now I'm earning interest off of what I stole from you. And mm -hmm. then um, the other the other alternative is if I steal a thousand dollars from you and then I feel guilty about it and I turn myself in and I come in. So I give it all back. But then I would also uh, pay on top of that. I would pay an extra 20 percent, which would be mm -hmm. 200 bucks in that case. So it would basically be a market interest rate because I stole the money from you, but then I gave it back. So it's sort of like I borrowed it. But yeah, the penalty would be a mand mandatory twenty percent, however long I had the money. Well, I can I can appreciate uh, you know the, kind of the idea there, where you know you're giving it back and then some to show that you're conducting penance and you're not just like paying back a loan or something. Um, well, it also encourages people to turn themselves in. No, yeah, I think I think it would. I think it would, and, and that would definitely be an incentive. Um, and in in your like theocratic idea of society or, or the, the, what it could be. Um, and 
do you think that it would be centralized in its justice or decentralized in its justice? Extremely decentralized. Okay. okay. So basically, and, uh, uh, my thought process would be, it is currently that people that are not willing to submit to God's justice, God, God will deal with them. I don't have authority over people that are not willing to be judged by me or by a Christian or anything like that. So I think everybody should have the liberty to choose their own judge in the case where there's either a crime or a dispute over a contract or something like that. People should be able to choose somebody that they want to arbitrate between them over some kind of a dispute. Mm-hmm. Okay, so the 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 idea being that ultimately, whether they choose it or not, they're going to be judged by God and stuff like that. You deal with right? the consequences. If you pick a bad judge, or a bad judge is forced to be over you because you didn't pick one for yourself, which is I think where we are mo- in most places in the world, definitely in America, everybody's sort of not really concerned with justice until mm-hmm. it happens to them. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's sort of where we're at now. Well, that, that's 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 just something I really agree with too. You know, it's not right now. Justice is a monopoly, an enforced monopoly. It's not the commodity it should be, um, because if we're forced to participate with uh, with this one, you know, monopoly based uh, central justice, nothing changes. No satisfaction is brought into play. No efficiency is brought into play. Um, one of the the major things uh, that I think a decentralized market would bring is people have to care. They have to be willing to engage and they have to say, what did Z company do this entire time? Like, look at their history. I want to make sure I'm making a good choice. Otherwise, what am I going to do when I go to this conflict resolution firm and they just like write a contract that totally screws me? Um, so the people will actually have to be concerned with it. And it's like how we're concerned with our, our fast food. You know, people don't go to, people don't go and get fast food because, uh, um, what was it? Uh, because like, oh yeah, um, the fast food is there or it's present. They go there because it's good, because it satisfies them. It's efficient. It's better than the competitor. Right. Um, and so people are it, satisfied with really bad food. And what's the root cause of that? People at this point are satisfied with really bad justice. And I ask, what's the cause of that? Well, it, it, government enforced monopoly. Yeah, um, I think the education I mean, it, system it, is at the heart of everything. Education system? I mean, uh, that, that is that is that is definitely one take of it. I think that if we if we lacked... Uh, if we lacked a centralized authority or a central usurper, um, we'd see people become more interdependent. And also, people would step up. I, I, I'm not. Yeah, they, they'd have to. I'm not. I'm not a vegan, but I'm very sympathetic to vegan causes because the government meat is an entire government monopoly. Without government meat mo- meat monopolies, we'd see like more veganism, but not as like militant militant veganism as we see today. We'd see more like natural veganism because. Honestly, oh god, have you ever watched What the Health <laughs> on on YouTube? Oh, you should. Uh, it's it's just it's shocking. And as a libertarian, I really empathize with it because these vegans were like, yeah, well, essentially, you know, the meat the meat companies they lobby the health board of the United States. They give them like you know a hundred thousand dollars in kickbacks and stuff like that. Lobbying is the most effective investment in America today. <laughs> People get like a it twenty is. time investment off of every dollar that they invest with the government lobbying. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they go, it, it's just that central authority that you can go in and say, hey, I'll scratch your back, you scratch mine. You're the ultimate back scratcher. Like, it, it's not, <laughs> it's nowhere near like me starting out a business and then, oh, there's this guy from Fox News, John Stossel. And he, he went around looking, yeah, he went around and like talked to public works monopolies and stuff like that. And he was like, you know, I thought there would be big companies here lobbying for themselves. They're like, oh no, they're here too. But like more people want public works and, and I was like, wow, so like all public works programs are just like, you know, people going up to senators and congressmen and just saying, here's $50 million, can you make it happen? And they're like, here, here's $50 billion, let's make it happen. It's like, oh God, it, it's terrifying. I think my favorite piece of John Stossel's was his affirmative action bake sale, if you've seen that one. Oh yes, when he made, he had the racist bake sale. Right. I, I, I recall that. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. It was fun. Um, I, I, would do, I would do that too, but I'd get killed. It would, it would kill me. Right. I'm in New York. Right. <laughs> the only reason John Sauce is still alive is because he had cameras rolling when he was doing all that stuff, but probably. Oh, yeah. Um, so I saw, I, I was watching part of your interview with Walter Block. Um, I really mm-hmm. liked the TP illustration that he used. Um, you mm-hmm. and I are really coming at the non aggression principle from different motivations. We agree on a whole lot in terms of like practical applications and outcroppings. And I think we draw a lot of the same economic and moral conclusions. 
I yeah. find it really interesting that we can agree on so much, but we, we ultimately, I think, disagree on the why question. Uh, mm-hmm. My answer to that would be, well, it's because God said so. Um, what's your approach? Is it pragmatism? Uh, personal happiness? Like, where are you coming at this from? Yeah. Well, I can empathize with uh, multiple uh, positions. Um, mainly that I, I, I love Rand for this, and I disagree with Rand too, but... I love Rand for this, you know. Uh, man, man is his own agent. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really butcher her right now, but man is his own agent, uh, with his own destiny, with only his own edict to follow, and his own edict is his own happiness, his own meaning. Um, and I, I really take that to heart in a lot of what I write. Um, and that's not just, oh, that makes it true or whatever. That's just something that that's that's symbolic to me. Whereas, uh, oh, listen, man is not, you know, your property is not my property. Uh, that guy's his own property. I'm my own property. Um, and I should, you know, go about my life and fulfill my life with I, my happiness, my meaning. And I know happiness and meaning are, are necessarily two different things at some points in time. Sometimes you have meaning without necessarily happiness. Sometimes you have happiness without necessarily meaning. You know, you can have joy and stuff like that. Um, but um, I, I digress from that, really. The the main point uh and why I come out from a logic based stand or a, a, a logic base, right? Is because I feel like the uh, the moral relativists, in a way, that are winning a lot on college campuses, they're winning a lot in academia, they're winning a lot in the media and, and, and all forms of media and stuff too, especially on Instagram where I'm, I'm most active. They say that the world is intangible, or sorry, that the world is a, is a shadow. It's Plato's shadow. It, nothing's real. There's no limits, there's no laws. Um, and therefore, treating your fellow man like treating him like a dog or slave in some in some way, it's not that. It's fine because it, it's all based in times and circumstances and stuff like that. And I totally disagree. I think that man, you know, from his genesis, lives with certain axioms. Um, and because we're highly competent beings, we, we can recognize these axioms. Um, and I talk about this in the book a little bit too. Man could say that he ignores the axiom of equal distances, right? Like uh, two objects are always equal distances from another, right? He can ignore that axiom. There are no inductively tangible consequences to that, to ignoring the axiom. That doesn't mean the axiom isn't valid. It doesn't mean that the logic isn't there, that there's not an, in, uh, an inquantifiable reality to our situation, right? Or it's not inquantifiable, an intangible reality to our situation. Um, and, you know, that's, that, that's you ignoring a logic on your own without conducting action. But when you ignore that someone is the genesis of their initiative and you go and enslave them, or when you ignore that supply and demand are, are a, a very real apodictic law, a very real logical law, um, one on one hand, you get a slave, you get a, a, a theft, you get a murder, you get a, an assault, right? You get a real, world, uh, a real world consequence from that for another person that's uninvolved and uninterested. Um, on the other hand, with supply and demand, you dissolve your business if you ignore this logical axiom. Logic is not a suggestion in society. It's not a perception in society. It is a fundamental law. It's a criteria in society. And I think that you know you can go to universe X. You can go to universe Y. You can go to universe G. Logic is forever there. Like like one of my uh, a couple of my friends said to me, "Oh well, no, different universes would have different logic." And I said, how is that even possible? How can you have different axioms of equal distances? It would just be a different a different term used to describe it. Or, or how would you have numerical imperatives or, or numerical outcomes um, different in different universes? You know, they'd have to be the same. Um, and people don't want to accept this concrete law of reality. They don't like it. And they don't like that when you talk about logic and human action, they kind of coincide in a lot of ways because – if if I'm not willing to accept that someone is the logical owner of their body and mind, or like you'd say you'd say stewardship, right? Um, then I must conduct an action that has an effect on them that is not that that is not um, consensual. It's not voluntary. It is not by their own agency and by their own will. And that's why I think that the Rand thing is so relevant because if I go and I hit Jane in the face, you know, involuntary of her position, she doesn't want to be hit. She doesn't want to try to fight me. Um, then I'm I'm obstructing her path, and I have no right to her path. I have no right to her. Uh, you know, if she, she's acting innocently. Of course, I'm not reacting for somebody or reacting for myself. I'm just you know going about it like I own her path, and I don't. I don't own her path. I don't own her body. Um, and that, that's something that's very real. Socialists don't want to see this. Meta, um, not metaphysicists. Uh, 
more relative to want to see this. And, um, you know, I can imagine you as a, as a person who's theocratic, uh, don't like moral relativists either. Um, and th- there's just so many conceits to their form of thinking that I, I couldn't just stand by and just say, all right, well, no, let, let me let someone else do it. Um, like, like hop, which I didn't, I didn't feel his theory was correct at all. I didn't feel his theory was, was, uh, was there. Um, so that's why I put my theory of ethics forward. Um, because I saw that, you know, like, all right, well, there, there's obviously a logical discernment to why we shouldn't hurt people. And I think I've done that. And I think anyone who says that it's an illogical discernment, I want to hear their priori. I want to hear the deductive tale onto why not. Um, and anyone who says that, uh, logic isn't reasonable, well, you've committed, or sorry, logic isn't, uh, valid for discerning, uh, precepts and behaviors, then, okay, you've committed a, a self-detonating argument, you know, all that, so... That's essentially, uh, you know, my response to that. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like the question, um, is a tree alive because it's growing or is it growing because it's alive? And I would say mm-hmm. you have to have both of those things at the same time. It's sort of like a person is, um, it's like, are people moral and therefore they prosper or are prosperous people moral? It's like, mm. which which came first, the chicken or the egg? And I think you got to have both at the same time. And they both sort of verify and, and prove each other. Yeah, the, um, uh, the, I, I just kind of like that. Um, the, the, I think that people look at morality and they see, uh, I guess they see a, like kind of like a more of a guiding light um, really than I do. I think that, you know, morality can be a very ugly thing when you allow people to conduct self-interestedness on in some levels um i think that sure. you know, drug addiction some, things like that drug, yeah yeah um some people can go on very awesome paths and some people can go on very sinister and and, and i think dumb ones personally you know subjectively i think they're dumb or whatever uh, but that the point is that it's their own path it's their own you know it's their own life to waste in my opinion and if they go if they go around and do it, if they go around and, and get themselves killed or, or they get themselves hurt, um, then it's just it's just their path at the end of the day. And that's, that's mainly I asked you about this at first and and don't think this don't think this the wrong way. I just don't know what your response is. Um, in your society, what would happen to homosexuals? Because I don't feel like, you know, there's any problem with being gay. So um, what would you, what would you think would happen? Right. Uh, well, number one, I would ask: Are they willing to submit themselves to uh, biblical justice or not? Um, I'd say okay. Let, let's say um, let's say they're not, because that would mean that they would be like you know something would happen to them, right? Right. So I would say um, for people that are not willing to be judged by the Bible and God's word, people that don't apply morality to themselves then they'll they'll reap the consequences of it and if they really are engaging in a homosexual behavior uh men men especially they will die i mean you get aids there's like there's not really very many ways to get aids okay okay so do, do you think that um can you tell me as like and i want to ask you some questions because i've been you know uh I've, I've answered i've answered a few and maybe not well you know i'm not i'm not the best at this no it's good but, yeah uh, it's my turn now <laughs> Awesome, awesome. Um, so, can you tell me, uh, firstly, why is uh, you know homosexuality immoral um, in 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 God's I guess in God's uh, book and in your discernment? Right. Um, so, ultimately speaking, the relationship between a man and a woman is supposed to be a picture of God and the people that He loves. So, mm-hmm. just the same way that a guy would love a particular woman, and he marries her, and he's he's bound to her for the rest of his life because he agrees to that, and he also they're they're going to reap the blessings of that relationship, children, um, work, uh, emotional fulfillment, all that type of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, okay. the picture of a man saying that I want to sow my seed, as it were, into another seed, like if you had a bowl of seeds. You can't plant a seed in a bowl of seeds. It's nothing is going to grow. Um, okay. So that's that's ultimately the reason why. And it's yeah, God God's designed the universe in a way that people that have anal sex die. Okay, all right. Just by um, just by disease, they reap they just reap the consequences of it. Okay, all right. Well, the um one of the one of the things uh, that I, I asked um I asked theocrats a lot or um, you know certain certain um, areas of mystics uh. What do you think? Um, Cause it, it's, it's crazy to think it's crazy that uh, 
we have such complex brains and we have uh, the ability to have these types of conversations, you know, uh, pondering our own existence and such. Um, do you think that, you know, it, it's that God, if like, cause again, I'm not necessarily a believer. So uh, let's say God, let's say God in this circumstance, you know, totally did everything. You're a hundred percent the right position. God gave us such uh, awesome brains that he kind of helped us say, wow, that's so illogical. And because like it, it is God in your? I'm sorry. Is God in your in your book um, perfect and uh, infinite? Yes. God is omnipotent, spaceless, timeless, and and all of that, and He's perfect or perfect, right? Like the 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 word of perfect, right? Right. Um. So the thing is, though, human beings with our crazy, awesome minds, we can't wrap our minds around what perfect is or what timeless and spaceless are because logic is is with us and our brains are able to perceive the logic right like um and that's what's really messing with me because like if god is there i just think he can make it easier uh, and i i mean hey i'm not saying like i demand you make it easier or whatever i'm just saying that like you know if you tell me that something is timeless and spaceless uh or, sorry spaceless timeless um but yet can conduct tangible reality or can or conduct itself with intangible reality then i have to say well no it's impossible because Square circles can't be a thing, or uh, it's impossible because the axiom of equal distance can't be changed, and it, God can't be uh, infinite if He can't change that, you know. Um, so that's one of my problems with it. Why did God give us such complex tools for thinking, um, and then just hope that, or not hope, just think, hey, you know, maybe they'll believe I'm real. It, it just because there's so many people that can create so many, like, like me especially. I have had so many thoughts with our conversations with my friends where I'm like, yeah, it doesn't make much sense to me. And we're not dumb people and then we're trying to give, you know, devil's advocate arguments, but it just doesn't make sense to us. So why is this the case? Right. Um, I'm my position is I don't believe that atheists exist. And the reason for that is because um, God is literally the definition of truth and logic. So to try to use deductive reasoning and logic and all that stuff to try to find God is sort of like uh, driving in your car, trying to find your car. Okay. You're, you're using, you're using the existence of God and the coherence of the universe that he's created in order to say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that it exists. I, I just, it's not, it's not that evident to, to me or my friends. I mean, it's just the, the idea here is that, um, you know, not only is God an intangible thing, but he's a tangible thing. That, that in and of itself, is, is it seems as though it's a contradiction to me. And, and, and my, my human brain cannot, it really can't. It really can't. I'm, I'm, put, I'm trying to make two plus two equal five here, but it's just not happening. You know what I'm saying? I can't unlock that for you. That's something that yeah. God has to do for every individual. Um, okay. It's like... If I was having uh, the best parallel that I can think of would be if I was having a conversation right now and you were trying to tell me that the English language didn't exist. Yeah, I would kind of I would kind of smile a little bit like you, you realize yeah. you're, that you're using the English language to tell me that you're doubting its existence. Right. You're made in the image of God and you're existing in the reality that God made. And you're trying to tell me that God's God might not exist. I it's it's a really weird thing to talk about. Um, mm. That's the conversation that we're having. Like we're using God's reality to talk about whether he's he exists or not. Like ev like literally everything is presupposed on his existence and his creation. So if God does exist, um, and right now would I be committing a sin by not you know saying he is my God? W would I be committing a sin? Y yes. So would I go to hell? I mean, I'm just, I'm just, I'm, just, I'm wondering. Like, right. Would I go to hell if I died right now? Right. Yeah. The default position is is hell, and the reason for that is because in the beginning, mankind, <laughs> mankind fell, and did an evil against God, right. and so that's the default position. So, and some people might say, well, that's not fair because somebody else did something, and I'm responsible for it. Well, the thing of it is, is in Christianity, you can also be made right in the eyes of God again by something that you also didn't do. So it's, it sort of evens out. All right. The, the, the problem here is that like, uh, let's say I go to heaven right now. Uh, cause I die. 
do I just go to hell? I'm just like, I, I want to say to God, hey, listen, like, man, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to call you man, but whatever. Uh, <laughs> um, if I said, if I said to, uh, if I said, oh, hey, you know, God, um, I didn't know you were real, man. I was trying to process it. Um, it wasn't working out. This brain of mine could only do so much with that. Doesn't it seem like God set me up to fail if he gave me this brain, you know? That's a really interesting question and one that Christians don't even all agree on. I would say, yeah, God does predetermine some people uh, not to be not to go to heaven. But isn't that just you know kind of mean unfair in a way? <laughs> yeah. So unfair. the the, yeah. the 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 illustration that Scripture uses to that is like, okay, you have a potter and he's making clay pots. Like, can't he can't he break one of them? Doesn't have he have the authority over his creation? A pot, like the pot that he just made, can't say, hey, you can't break me. Like, that's not fair. And the potter's like, shut up. This is not your place to say that. I'm the potter. I get to decide what happens with you. You're my property. Ah, uh, but the, the pot, the pot isn't like a sapient being, though. The in terms, terms of <laughs> scripture, like, literally, we are, like, in the beginning, mankind was literally made out of dirt and had life breathed into it. I mean, awesome, but, you know, hey, God... I assert self ownership. It, it, it doesn't seem right, man. Yeah, <laughs> he doesn't accept that answer. He doesn't accept the answer like, "Oh God, I wasn't aware of your existence." It's like, no, you know that God exists, and you're in, and you're in cognizant rebellion. You may suppress things that are true, like somebody might be in self denial, but it really doesn't change anything. It's an interesting discussion. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not bothered that you're not totally convinced by it because ultimately speaking, I can't convince you of anything. Yeah, I mean, like I, I've tried to wrap my 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 head around it a few times, and I just feel like you know, like me not being like, like what what happens to a person who's unaware of the Christian Judean God? Like, what happens to them? Like, who's completely like like who has like no no one in their family ever taught them? They're in like some place which is like mainly like like let's say um Islamic, and they're not even really Islamic; they're atheists because they don't believe in Islam. But you know, they they don't know of Christianity. Would that um uh, what would you say to that? Well, so, yeah, that's a really interesting question. There are, technically speaking, two ways to go to heaven. Mm -hmm. uh, practically speaking, there's only one. But there is technically another way. If somebody is an absolutely perfect person and never does anything wrong or thinks anything sinful then and only did good things, then that person would go to heaven also. I mean, it, that's the, that's so the other far, requirement. Is, is, is it just the nap then? Or is it like... I mean, there's other things than that. Well, yeah, right? it's God's it's um, God's complete definition of the non-aggression principle because ultimately it would be uh, all aggression is against God, all sins are against God. Ultimately, okay, you can't use I, you can't use God's property, which is me. I can't use it in any way that would derive God of His liberty, which and His liberty is He's supposed to have complete control over me because He made me. Okay, uh, the the thing that, I mean again. You know, it, it's just difficult to think about because, like, let's say Bob, he didn't know what God was or didn't know the idea of God. Uh, the specifics, atheist, right. Uh, yeah, he didn't know the specifics of God or anything like that. Or that there was a creator. He just thought, you know, um, the man came from water, et cetera, right? Um, and in that, you know, he, like, sometimes lies because – it just feels like, you know, there, there's there's a need to, like, lie to his mother about his homework or something. Yeah, that would be advantageous wanna... or prosperous to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, Bob, later on in life, when he dies, he, he never violated the nap in my book, right? Like, he never, like, conducted the initiation of force and stuff like that. Um, but he did violate God's nap by lying. Is God going to say, hey, it was just a few lies? Or is he going to be like, you going to hell? There are a couple but, of different... Um... Like the people that understand the law better are more responsible than people that have never heard it. So there is something to say for that. What as to what all the exact details of the punishment in the next life are, I'm I'm not sure. Um, I do know that people that like um, the Jews they rejected the Messiah, and so they were held more responsible than the people in the surrounding nations who were never even given, you know, the Old Testament. Is it um? Do you think it's a little scary to think that, like, because uh, he's it, God is omnibenevolent, right? Um, yes. Isn't it a little, I don't know, screwed up in a way to say that, like, an omnibenevolent being 
like puts his creations in a lake of fire and stuff like that. Like justice and love are incompatible. No, like, I, I, I can I want a murderer to be put to death, and I, I would actually argue that that's the loving thing to do in that situation would be to require a swift judgment because ultimately speaking uh by doing that you're preventing more people from being killed and you're also a, also holding up the value of life no the, the thing the thing that that bothers me i don't care if a murderer or a rapist burn for a long time i i don't care um that's not really my concern my concern is the guy who was sexually attracted to other guys because something in his brain told him to be it was an imperfect. Or the person that lied to his parents about h- having done his homework. Yeah, I mean, both of them don't. They didn't violate the nap, in my opinion. I don't want them to. I don't necessarily want anyone to die. So I, I, I don't think that they deserve that. I mean, it, I guess it's not up to me, right? But I, again, I just don't see that a lake of fire would be fitting for them. You know. Right, and that's where we have to realize that our understanding of God isn't isn't accurate. Um, God is so perfect. And he's so separate from his creation that the smallest sin is the same as literally breaking every single law that it's possible to break. Um, that's, that's the standard of perfection that he requires. He's so good. And he's, there, there is not the tiniest hint of a shadow of evil that's a part of his character that he can't tolerate. You, he can't tolerate the smallest system? little... Sorry, what? How do you feel about the Old Testament? A little, uh, just uh, wondering. Uh, it's still it's still applicable, and people that obey it will be blessed. Um, uh, there there's a lot of like uh, I watch a guy Dark Matter Man. You might like you might like him, you might hate him. I'm okay. not sure how you feel about him. I'll look him up. The uh, Dark Matter Man two four nine eight. Um, he he has some he has some videos I like. Um, you might not like them though. I'm gonna be honest. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're very uh, they're very um you know, anti-religious, but, uh, um, in it, I learned about some resources that showed me contradictions in the old Testament and stuff. What are, what are your kind of answers to the questions of the old Testament or to the contradictions of the old Testament, specifically one, um, that said God's anger is forever and God's anger, uh, is, is, is like short is, is like completely short. And then he just forgives immediately after he's angry. There are two contradictions. There's, there's a lot of them that I found, but, um, those two stuck with me. Um, and what do you say to that contradiction? Uh, do you think that what, what's up with that? You know? Yeah. So um, ultimately the Bible is my, is literally my standard of what is right and what is wrong. So it would be like me asking, well, what if logic were in logic were illogical? It would be the same sort of question that if I were to ask you that you would sort of be like, that doesn't really make sense. So in okay. terms of the Bible, I assume that both of those things are true in context. They make, they make sense in terms, but you have to accept the Bible on its own terms. It's a, it's a fully coherent. I assume it to be a fully coherent system. And then uh, prosperity, longevity, and all that type of stuff is the evidences of its truth. Okay. Um, the only problem is that, you know, cause it's the word of God and, and that I would, I would think that like, you know, again, it's just the, the idea of it being a perfect being also kind of gets in the way of it a little bit, because if it's a perfect being and there's no mistakes, how can it be contradictory? Right. Well then I would ask if, if I see a problem with the book, it's not with the book. It's with me. It's with my understanding. Your perception. If I said to you, if, if I told you that there is a, like the law of non-contradiction or something else like that it is wrong. If I, if I am reading something that's perfectly logical mm-hmm. and I see that's wrong, is the problem with the law of non-contradiction or is the problem with my understanding of it? Mm. Uh, that's a, that's, it's definitely interesting. It's definitely interesting to put forward. Um, I just think that, you know, it's a, it's a lot to be expected of. And again, like, you know, like this is more of a, we're, we're, we're not really good diving into this too seriously. Maybe one day I won't be as confused. Um, and my, there are definitely, you know, better people to make different arguments uh, on this specific topic. But I feel as though, you know, if we're created in this image and we have all these beautiful gifts of, of sapiency, of high competency, we're able to, you know, uh, philosophize and um and think about ponder our existence you know especially being so different from other animals whereas other animals cannot ponder their existence in reality um they just kind of exist in instinctual nature 
um, I feel as though it's a little, I don't know, it's a little rash to say that the, the person who conducts a victimless act uh, is a person who, uh, and, and maybe you'd say the victim is God here. Yes. But um, yeah, it's it, 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 it observable. It, it, okay, okay. There's another thing too. It's just that the only observable reality that we exist within is the inductive and deductive one. Um, and like, I can't know that I'm hurting God if I'm lying and I don't know God's existence or it's just never been proven to me. It's like, you know, it, it's like me saying that I'm, I'm hurting gravity because I'm ignoring the axiom of, uh, the, the axioms that follow, or sorry, the, the inductive proofs that follow the axioms, uh, of gravity and stuff. I would like, give you that if, if God didn't give everybody a conscience, everybody has a pretty good idea of what right and wrong is. They know they shouldn't kill people. Now people can no, sort yeah, of yeah. Sear, sear their consciences, but there is a, there is a law that is written on our own, in our, in our own minds that we know that we violate. So nobody gets to, when they die, nobody's going to say, well, God, I just didn't know, have any concept of what right and wrong are. Nobody's going to get away with that. I don't know, but the thing is that it, it, it's the gay thing is a little vague, and the lying thing I don't think is necessarily immoral. I think that when you lie to somebody, you don't necessarily do it for bad reasons. Uh, well, right, yeah. you, I think it would be good to clarify um, d- different types yeah. of lying because there are some types of lying that I think the Bible actually condones and exemplifies and says like you should you should do this. There was one point where um, the ruler of Egypt told all the Hebrew midwives go and kill all the male children that are born of the, of the Hebrews. Yeah. And they went and they didn't do that. And then he mm-hmm. come, he, he calls him back and he says, why haven't you done, haven't you killed all the children? Like I told you to. And they said, Oh, well, Pharaoh, um, these Hebrew women, they're just so vigorous. They just give birth before we can even get to them. And, and so, yeah, we're not, which that's a total lie. Like they lie, they, they yeah. straight up lied to, to the Pharaoh. Yeah. And the, the Bible says that God blessed those midwives and gave them large families for lying. Mm. So, uh, yeah. what, what about, what about like, uh, let me give you an example. Um, cause I can, I can appreciate that, you know, you're saving lives and all that by lying. Um, and they're innocent lives, honestly. So the, the thing that, um, I'm saying is like wife comes out of a room. Hey, do I look good in this? She really doesn't, but you don't want to hurt her feelings and you want to have a nice evening. So you say to her, yes, you look great, honey, or whatever like that. Um, how is that like, does God just, like, it would eat, depend you know, on the motivation like, of, it would depend, it, honestly speaking, it would depend on the motivation of the lie because there is wisdom involved in those types of questions. Yeah. Okay, so like, let's say we have specific knowledge. Let's say, because uh, I, I can appreciate that, and there's certain wisdom. Uh, all right, so he wants to have a nice evening. He doesn't want her to be upset. Those are his motivations. Uh, if he said that she doesn't look good, you know, they'd have a terrible evening. They'd be arguing. They'd be fighting. It wouldn't be very nice. Um, if she said, and he, she'd also feel bad about herself. She'd feel self-conscious and all that stuff. Um, and ultimately, it would negatively impact the relationship and the night in a in, in some manner that can be quantifiable later. Um, it would also depend on the, her motivation for asking the question. Does she really want to know his honest answer of, do you think that I look attractive? You, the husband has to be able to know what she's really asking through the subtext of the, like the, the real honest question behind the question. If she really wants to know, Hey, do I look ugly? And are we going to have a problem tonight? Because somebody's going to tell me that I look ugly. That's the reason that she's asking. I think, yeah, it would be wrong for him to say, "Yeah, honey, you look great." If she's asking, to, she she just it's sort of an impassing thing, and she's like, you know, how do I look? And he's like, you look great. Uh, I don't think there's that's necessarily a, uh, that I would call that an immoral lie. Um, the Bible doesn't say it's a sin to lie. In the Ten Commandments, it says, "You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor," which is really a, a legal a legal process like a, a witness like in a in a crime or something like that is the context yeah. of that commandment okay. um i'm just afraid of like you know uh <laughs> what if i tell my friend uh, uh you know mike or alana or something like that hey you look really good and then you know i'm in a lake of fire it's just like <laughs> well everybody's already like... going to end up in the lake of fire so one more ultimately speaking is not that big a deal i to me it is um, especially if I'm the, you know, the, the swimmer, I guess, in that situation. Um, you see that, that it's, it's, it's just, it's, it, 
it's hard for someone, I guess, uh, who's non theologian or non non Christian, uh, to wrap their head around. Um, so what's penance like? I mean, uh, listen, listen, we, we're not, we, I would love to come back one day and we can have like a full on debate, uh, of to God's existence and stuff like that. And, uh, I have a friend, Dwayne, who could probably come on too. And, and he, he'd probably love talking to him, um, and, uh, have that debate. Um, but tell me, so like if you, uh, die and you say you accept Jesus Christ into your heart, cause that's, that's, um, you know, accept Jesus Christ into your heart. What happens to you then? If like after I died, I then I not after like, like you're you're in the process you're like about to die. Let's say I'm about to die, and and I truly have faith that God paid the paid the full penalty for me. Yeah. Then then I'll go to heaven. Hmm. Okay. Is that something that like is guaranteed to everybody? Like uh, if a rapist said it, would that happen? Yes. Ah. <laughs> um. I just, it just seems, I don't know, man. I don't want that rapist to go to heaven. <laughs> so yeah, the, uh, the example that scripture uses is you, there are, there are two lives. There's a first life and there's a second life. Let me give you this example. So there's a guy who committed murder and he's in a, he's in a free market trial where they are actually going to require that he could be put to death. Um, the person who died, his family, they're the accusers. Everybody saw it happen. It's a really cut and dried, open, shut case. You had, you had cameras, you had, let's say you had 10 people see it and they're all at the, at the trial to give uh, a testimony. And the, the murderer is standing there. He's convicted. They're literally about to take him out the back and do a hang him or firing squad, whatever your, um, whatever would be an agreeable form of execution. And right before they're about to do that, the judge that's been listening to this entire case has compassion on the murderer. He sees that the murderer is totally broken over what he did. He wishes that he could, because he's going to be put to death and it's not going to get back the person that he killed. It's not going to bring him back to life. I know Walter Block talks about it. He's like, if we could run somebody through a machine uh, and take your life and give it back to the person that you killed, a reanimation machine, um, that would be great. But ultimately, the reason that we kill people is because the person that killed like their life is forfeit. They stole a life. They should owe a life. Mm -hmm. Um, what if, so this guy's about to be let out. What if the judge steps down from his thing and he says, you know what? Kill me instead. And I want you to let the murderer, the murderer go. Ah, is that permissible? Ah, I don't think it would be. I don't think the insurance company that represents the victim would, would like that very much. <laughs> what do you think that that would do to the murderer? What what would he think about that? Well, the murderer would probably be very grateful, I guess, but do you think he's, do you think his life would change? Probably would, uh, but a good man life, a good man's life will also end in that process, right? Like the, the judge was probably a very good man or he could, he, he was, I guess in perspective he was, but, yeah, because he's not a murderer. He's a yeah. He's he's the head of the conflict resolution firm. Maybe he took some bribes. I get that, but uh, beyond that, he probably never you know really violated an app too much, uh, or at least uh, hopefully not at all. Um, so the the judge was a good man. He sacrificed his life for this murder, and the murderer gets now free. You know, there's no charges against him because he took the took the crime. And now, what happens to the judge? Does he go to hell or heaven? The judge, the judge would die. I'm just keeping this to the the physical life, the here and now, for the oh, illustration. Okay, 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 okay. So the judge dies, and um, the murderer walks free from this. Right. I mean, I, I, honestly, I might kill him <laughs> if he killed uh, if he killed someone I knew, and he just like some, the judge was like, I sacrificed myself. But a you life know? has been paid. Like, let's say, let's say somebody wants to buy your dinner. Okay. If let's say I owe twenty bucks for my dinner, and somebody else comes and says, Hey, you know, uh. Here, I, I want to pay this for you. Well, yeah, I mean, they're paying their debt, um, but in in the way of the uh, in the way of the, I guess the actor, the debt isn't really repaid if they don't get punished or if they don't die. Um, I Somebody think has to die. Yeah, it's a if, requirement if, of paying a so life. I think someone has to die, but I think that that specific actor owned their initiative, you know, and. In owning their initiative, they own the consequence of that initiative, and that consequence should be death. I I would say that it would if he wanted to go in and say I'll I'll die for him. 
I don't know what conflict resolution court would allow. Let's say the right? murderer was feeling so terrible about it that he turned himself in and said, I want you guys to put me to death. Like that's, that's just, that's fair. Like, so that's, that's the attitude that I have now because Christ did that for me. Um, there's an illustration, um, in the Sermon on the Mount. If Jesus said, if somebody, um, sues you and takes your shirt and the implication is there is that it's wrong. Like, so it's being st- stolen from you through the legal process. It's being legally stolen from you like tax money or something. Um, yeah. It's, he says that your response is supposed to be, you give him your jacket also. If somebody steal, sues you and steals your shirt, you give him your jacket. And the reasoning for that is because, okay, I know that this world, there is justice. So in the future, when, when justice is required of this guy who's stealing my shirt, he's mm-hmm. going to have to pay the shirt that he stole back, but then an additional item, right? Because that's the penalty. Yeah. I know this guy is going to need an additional shirt in the future, so I'm going to give it to him. And then I wouldn't have any problem with that person also then calling the authorities and saying, hey, I'm taking this guy to court. And so when you take it through the whole legal system, what ends up happening is that I get back both of my garments. I get my shirt and my jacket back, and the other guy is out nothing whatsoever. And then the other guy, his debt's been paid. He's not a criminal anymore. He's not a felon. Um his debts totally wiped clean and I've lost nothing. I got back everything that was originally mine and we can both go our many ways and maybe even become friends. I take him out to lunch. Hmm. In in my, uh, okay. So my discernment of it, how a a private Arbor, I guess would, uh, would have handle a situation like this. Um, they'd say, all right, you know, John, John L, um, you know, you're being charged with a capital crime. Uh, you murdered, you know, Susan, whatever. Her family's insurance company is prosecuting you. And then he says, oh, no, this 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 guy over here, you know, he's really – he feels bad for me and he wants to sacrifice himself. I don't think that insurance company would be like, yeah, let's do that. You know, and it's, it's kind of their choice because they're the prosecuting party too. And the conflict resolution firm would be like, yeah, we don't care. Who, like, like, I'm interested know? to – to hear your answer, who do you think would be offering insurance against people murdering? Like I would ask, okay, why do you have an insurance policy against murdering somebody? Are you planning on murdering somebody? Oh no, no. Well, the, the, um, okay. So the way I see decentralized justice is pretty, it is pretty interesting. I think that people will have insurance companies that will back them with security services, litigation firms. It'll be like a package deal, right? Litigation firms. And, um, Security services, litigation firms, and of course they'll have like their you know natural insurance over house, over life, and stuff like that. Kind of like um, being a member of CareFlight, where you have you pay like twenty five bucks a month, and if you ever need to get CareFlighted, instead of charging you thirty grand, it's it's free because you're a member. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, so like, you're saying the same like type that. of thing for insurance, legal insurance? Yeah, essentially, essentially. And then there's also you know they have connections to conflict resolution firms that they'll go to and stuff like that in case of an emergency and all that. Um, and that would be an insurance against a murderer because uh, they, they, they'd have litigants that were experienced in some type of, uh, uh, of conflict resolution like that. Um, so I think that, that that would be how, like, you know, um, I don't think they're planning on getting murdered or murdering. It's just like a safety net type thing. Like, I never plan on my house burning down, you know, it just it might. <laughs> so I have. Right. Um, just one last question. Um, what are the most positive results that you currently see in America from either voluntarist or um, anarcho-capitalist thinking. Well, people, uh, pe- there's a lot of different things. And empirically, uh, you know, four hundred billion dollars every year is donated by private persons to other private people um, in in response to you know their tragedies or their need for uh, resources. And it just shows how much wealth can be shared uh, based on you know people seeing value in others um, and can and you know conducting themselves in that way. And on another end, um, it's been uh, inspiring. No matter how many leftists I see. Whenever I make a libertarian or whenever I see a new libertarian, it's good to see someone who believes in peace, who believes in freedom, um, and who just, you know, essentially doesn't want to, uh, you know, impose an, an edict on humanity that would, you know, cause its doom or its austerity or, you know, uh, the disembarking of a body. So it, it's, it's, um, or soul from a body. Um, but at the end of the day, like when you know, because I think you're 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 pretty much a libertarian too, right? Outside right. of the other, 
um, outside of the more, more uh, I guess, metaphysical things. The, the goal of libertarians should be to convey our message as one of pre- peace, prosperity, and logic, and freedom. Um, and that if, if you don't accept these, then, you know, you can. Of course you can. But you will face a world that's filled with just horror, that's just endless wars, uh, uh, austerity movements that will, will last generations. And, you know, just lies, corruption, and, and mal, and true greed, not capitalism, true greed. Um, and it will just be a worse off world, and, and you'll ha- you won't be able to live the life you desire to live. Um, so, yeah, th- thank you for this, and I, I hope that answered everything. Um, you know, I just think as libertarians, you know, peace, love, prosperity, if those are our positive messages, and we do not stray from them. So act as hominous, human ethics defined. I'd love it if you guys can give it a, a look. Uh, check it out. If you guys disagree with it, um, I'm at ANCAP Society on Instagram. Uh, it's ANCAP underscore uh, society underscore. Uh, and I'm always willing to debate. So, Awesome. Thank you, man. Have a good one.